Summoning artists to participate in the august occasions of the state seems something artists ought to celebrate. Today is for my cause a day of days, and his be poetry's old-fashioned praise, who was the first to think of such a thing. These words were spoken by the poet Robert Frost, an elderly man by this point in 1961 in January. It was the first time a poet had been asked to speak at a presidential inauguration in America, and it began a trend that's continued up through 2021. I want to talk for a few videos about inaugural poets, and we start with Robert Frost. Now, Robert Frost, you're familiar with him, likely from Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening and other poems that have wheedled their way into the American imagination and the American heart. Robert Frost started his career in the teens. He actually moved to Britain to start his career, published a few collections of poetry in the uh, World War I era, um, and then moved back to America by the 20s and started a very distinguished career which lasted through the 60s. In the 40s, Frost published a poem called The Gift Outright, which was a very patriotic poem, uh, a poem that's been criticized for being perhaps um, uh, too narrowly focused on certain aspects of American and American history and not others. Um, but it was a poem that was written kind of as the country transitioned from the Great Depression into, uh, into World War II. And so it was very much a, a calling back to the bravery of the patriots of the American Revolution and calling on Americans to uh, fight once again. This poem made an uh, outsized impact on a young John F. Kennedy. And so when Kennedy was elected in 1960, he asked Frost to come and read The Gift Outright, this poem from the 40s, at his inauguration. Now, apparently Robert Frost agreed, and then the night before the inauguration, started to feel a little odd about the fact that he was reading a poem that was almost two decades old. And so he wrote a rather long introductory poem to The Gift Outright. And that, now this is a famous anecdote. He begins to read the words that I read to you at the beginning of this video, starting with summoning artists to participate in the august occasions of the state seems something artists ought to celebrate. Now, it, it's kind of, you know, Robert Frost is just chatting with us, and yet he's using his beautiful iambic pentameter and rhyming uh, line endings. But the problem was, after he got about as far as I got reading it, the sun, which apparently was... Uh, creating quite a glare on the paper he was reading from, and the wind which was ruffling the paper uh, made it almost impossible for an elderly Robert Frost to keep reading. And so uh, about 10 or so lines into the poem, he says into the microphone, and I'll, I'll put the video down in the, down in the description below uh, so you can watch it yourself. He basically says, I can't, I can't see my own poem. And so he puts down his introductory poem, which wasn't the best poem in the world, uh, most, most agree. Um, and then he closes his eyes and recites from memory the gift outright. And so I'm going to read to you the poem that he read in its entirety at that inauguration. The land was ours before we were the lands. She was our land more than a hundred years before we were her people. She was ours in Massachusetts, in Virginia, but we were England's, still colonials, possessing what we were still unpossessed by, possessed by what we now no more possessed. Something we were withholding made us weak until we found that it was ourselves we were withholding from our land of living and forthwith found salvation in surrender. Such as we were, we gave ourselves outright. The deed of gift was many deeds of war, to the land vaguely realizing westward, but still unstoried, artless, unenhanced, such as she was, such as she would become. Now, when we, he read it at the inauguration, he paused right as such as she would become. And he said, I'm going to change it to such as she will become. There, there was a real, a real projected optimism in Frost's whole demeanor. And at the end of the, uh, of the poem that he didn't actually get to read all of, um, there's some lines that people have talked about as being just very rosy and maybe even bombastically optimistic. This is how 
his uh, original introduction to that poem ended. The glory of a next Augustan age, of a power leading from its strength and pride, of young ambition eager to be tried, firm in our free beliefs without dismay, in any game the nation wants to play, a golden age of poetry and power, of which this noonday is the beginning hour. Now, many who have read both The Gift Outright and this uh, opening introductory poem, which he only read part of, I've talked about how Robert Frost seems kind of jingoistic in his, you know, this is just the greatest. Uh, today we're beginning this new golden Augustan age. It's almost imperial sounding, isn't it? Um, but people have pointed out how, you know, JFK projected very much a sort of pioneer language in his uh, in his campaign, he talked about a new frontier, that the 60s would be a time when Americans, just like they had struck out across the plains in the 1800s, in the 1900s were on a new frontier. Now the space race and other things were certainly a civil rights uh, which was very important to JFK and would be a gigantic fight for the first few years of the 1960s. These were the new frontier that JFK was looking at. And so I think Robert Frost was trying to pick up on this new frontier language. Now, today, that frontier language rings a, a bit sour in our ears. And if we look at the gift outright, you know, where are the indigenous peoples of America, for example, in the gift outright? The land was ours before we were the lands. He's talking about the English colonials. Was it really theirs before they were the lands? Um, we also have this... Uh, very interesting description at the end to the land vaguely realizing westward but still unstoried artless unenhanced these lines have probably got the most criticism by uh, by both historians and other poets um is it true that america before the English colonists moved westward with this sort of manifest destiny attitude. Uh, was it really unstoried, artless, and unenhanced? I think there are two ways to read it. There's a way to, way to say, yeah, he is totally eclipsing the indigenous peoples who did have stories, who did have arts, who did enhance the land with their cultures, with their agriculture. You know, let's remember that it was uh, the indigenous peoples of the East Coast who taught the English colonists, not so grateful, uh, how to survive uh, in the in the uh, in the winters in those first few years that the colonists were here. Um, I'm not a historian, and we don't need to go into all the details. But it's important to remember that language like this often sounds to us as if Frost is wholly ignoring everyone except for the English colonists. And yet, I think there's another way to read this, um, which isn't necessarily contradictory to that um, to that other view that he's calling the English colonists in particular unstoried, artless, unenhanced. And it's certainly true that in the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, there's this question of, are the English colonies, which are now free, ever going to make anything of themselves culturally? Or are they all going to be sort of these um, bombastic rustics? Now, of course, this flowering of art and culture in the Eastern colonies uh, by the mid-19th century, which we often call the American Renaissance, um, we know that uh, those colonies did not stay unstoried, artless, and unenhanced. But there's still really this ambivalence, I think, in the language, uh, even with this phrase, vaguely realizing westward. Is Frost excited about the westward expansion, the manifest destiny attitude uh, of the early Americans? Is he ambivalent? It's a vague realizing there's a lot to talk about and mull over in this first inaugural poem and the accidents of that day. What would have happened if he had been able to read that whole introductory poem? Would people even been more mad at it? Robert Frost is a master of language and he very much defined in the consciousness of the early 20th century a very simple, straightforward New England Anglo voice and perfected it in very polished poetry. For better or worse, he begins the inaugural tradition. In future videos, we'll look at how Bill Clinton and Barack Obama bring in new ages and new aspects of inaugural poetry and poets to American history.